Thank you, Jens. Um, yeah, regulatory balance is actually what I do. Um, and it, we actually calculate regulatory balance. When we make a regulatory decisions, what we do is that we make sure that every, nobody gets too much and nobody gets too less, which means that everybody... I, my job is to, to really to make sure that everybody is equally unhappy all the time, which, you, which is fun to be a regulator. Good morning to you all. Are there any engineers in this room? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the regulatory perspective rather than talk about technologies, it's okay. And true to my form and true to my reputation, I will try to be slightly provocative because I also think it's important when you have a thought session that you actually have someone who talks about something different. So that's what I'm going to do. I mean, to, be, to be honest, you talked a little bit about it, and I agree with you. Uh, mobile is a, is a very interesting technology. And it's a very important technology that a lot of people are using. But there's one more technology that's actually much more successful than, than mobile. And that's internet. That's IP. And think about it. I'm, I'm more than 50 years old. I was 30 years old before the first text message was ever sent. I was brought up ha happily. Um, actually, I have one of my old neighbors here, happily, without internet. Today, internet and IP traffic is one of the... I, mean, I have three kids. Uh, I built a new house on an island, uh, actually close to Jens. I have no mobile coverage at all. My kids doesn't like to be there for some reason. <laughs> what we really have seen over the last years is that the convergence of networks into an all IP network. When I speak to the broadcasting industry, they don't really agree with me. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there who still doesn't agree. This is, not, this is about access to internet, nothing else. This has created an enormous change of a business model that has, created, that has been there for, for the last 100 years. I and mean, when the operators, as we talked about, made money out of telephone calls. That was their real business model by minutes. The third thing that happened is that all access gone wireless. I'm not using mobile, I'm using wireless. Because of the smartphone and all the other wireless devices, people is now, and companies, whatever you do, in business or private, the first thing you do is connect to wireless networks. These are the three big trends. And I have very big problems with this one. My head is probably not constructed for this wireless fan. So before we start, I just want to give you a snapshot for the Swedish market. Uh, just to give you a view, and kind of sliding into the regulatory issues that we see. First of all, uh, we see a fiber explosion in Sweden. Last three weeks, the Swedish broadcaster SVT has been ro running a big campaign for fiber by going out in the countryside and asking people, what do you need the most? And you can expect that they will, you know, alcohol, food, anything else, fiber. People in this country, for some odd reason, is screaming for fiber. I, ask, I always ask academics, could you please tell me why people want fiber in this country? We haven't really found out a good solution. My theory is very dark and cold, six months of the year, we've got exactly nothing else to do to play with new technologies. But we have today a fiber revolution in Sweden. Actually, now we have more fiber um, subscriptions than we have ADSL. 60% of all households and companies in Sweden now have access to 100 megabit or more. This would be nice if you were in Singapore or Hong Kong or somewhere else, but have you seen Sweden on a map? We have the same people density out of the cities and the villages that the Sahara Desert, with more snow, and it's much colder. I mean, nobody lives in this country, <laughs> probably for good reasons. And this is something that is really changing the whole landscape of the infrastructure, because we're using fixed that is where we go, and we use mobile when we are mobile. I spoke to the uh, Telecom, which is the company that provides television services in this country, stately owned, and they have another. They, their business model is now changed because what people is doing is that when they get on a fiber, they scrap everything else. They don't use the broadcaster television. They don't listen to radio. The they, they only thing they do is to connect to their fiber. And when they move out of their home, they use mobile. 
At the same time, 4G subscription has gone up. That's the other theme of the, uh, what's happened in the last couple of weeks in the Swedish television, is that coverage is a big thing. We only have about 82% country coverage in Sweden, um, and that's very, very bad. No, it's not, but that's what people are telling me. So you can see that 4G has gone up dramatically over the last couple of years. This has presented actually a new business case for the mobile operators. Uh, which was Eric really said, there is money to be made. Uh, mobile operator still makes a lot of money. But what really happened over the last five years is that data has gone from being nothing to more than 35, about 35% of their total revenue. So when I speak to operators, and op are there any operators here? One of them. Two. There is a grave area in this one. Uh, which has been quite substantial over the last couple of years. But this is the real thing that happened, uh, which we tied. This is one of the start regulatory issues for us. Because we see that mobile industry, as an industry, doesn't exist the same way it did before. Cisco told me last year that the traffic type that increases the most is mobile offload. Most of the time, any smart device, even if it's a te telephone, a sensor, whatever it is, and most things are fixed, are using a Wi-Fi network. And it's only when you get mobile, you're actually moving, that you use a mobile, uh, a mobile network. When you have a fixed strong point, that's where you're going to connect yourself. Are anyone using Wi-Fi here? I think it's really funny. Last year, uh, this year in February, I was in. Uh, does it, any one of you go to Barcelona and the GSMA? Yeah. Did you use the mobile network while you were there? I used the Wi Fi networks. <laughs> there were thousands of Wi Fi networks at GSMA. I thought that was hilariously funny. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> People told me it's because of roaming. This is the question, the first regulatory question we really ask ourselves. Remember, what do we like as a regulator? We like choice. With that said, we don't like monopolies. We like competition because we think competition is one of the most important things. One of the things we do, and I will come back to that a little bit later, is about bottlenecks. Where are the future bottlenecks? But that's what we like. We like integrity. That companies shouldn't be able to sell information about personal information about you as they want. This is one of the big challenges in Europe right now, which is very, very important to us. But competition, integrity. We like inclusion. I will come back to that as well a little bit later. But this is really one of the big regulatory issues for us. Because depending on where you are, you will have different answers to this one. The simple one would be, will all devices have a SIM card? will be controlled, even if it starts in a fixed network, will end up in a mobile network and therefore need, need a SIM card to have all those things that you need. Or it will be the other way around, that the wife, everything that's wireless will get into a fixed network. Why is this important? Standardization. One of the big obstacles for us right now is to figure out how should the future standardization look in whatever you call it, 5G, 6G, or whatever it is, so we don't re-monopolize a market that has actually opened up again. If you can, after this session, please tell me the answer to this question, I'll be very happy, and you will save a lot of work and a lot of money for the Swedish taxpayers, because we haven't figured this out yet. But do you understand the problems with it? Also coming to the fact that we all agreed on the Internet of Things, but most things are not mobile. <laughs> I have a teenage son, so I som sometimes think about my refrigerator. Uh, but it's the most things are actually fixed. Will they benefit of having a SIM card? And how do you get, there are things that are mobile. How do you get into them to the same system? And they're all going to use IP. Do you see my problem? Will you fix it for me? I will come back and later. OK. When we go out and ask for customer wants, and these are not only consumers, these are also companies. Every year we do a, do stu do a big study, at least in Sweden, we ask them what they want. The first thing they want is speed. The funny thing that when, when it, what is speed? I know that in, in the UK, when they talk about speed, super fast is 30. Our speed limit here is 100. I'm trying to convince the EU to call it super duper fast, but I can't get through on that one. But speed is the number one thing they want. 
They want access on every device, every type of system, independently of network. Don't want to be limited. They want mobility. Mobility is not the same way as moving around with your device. But there will also be mobility when we ask the customers, it's really about you can have your own applications on every device, on every network all the time, which is one of the benefits and one of the problems with the internet. They want quality and capacity. The funny thing is the quality capacity is increasing, as Eric says, um, especially the quality ratio over the last couple of uh, years has increased a lot. But the most important, they want all content available through the internet. I mentioned one of the things which, which is one of, apart from competition, don't like monopolies, is also inclusion is very for important in the regulatory world. And it's often forgotten that a shift like this creates also the problems or the potential problems uh, for people being outside the digital world. I'm old enough to remember post offices. When I grew up, we had post offices in Sweden. I'm that old. We don't have post offices in Sweden. Since 50, I'm regulator of that one, I can't remember, it was 15 or 20 years ago. We actually got rid of post offices. In Sweden, when, when you, every year you have this big happy thing that you do your taxes. And um, actually, if you use a smartphone or internet, you get your money back from your taxes earlier than if you do it on paper. I still haven't figured out what I actually think about that. The thing is that what I have to make sure of, we all know where we're going, we all know where we are, uh, but I have to make sure that during this travel that society is doing, my job is to make sure that no one is left behind. So in every regulatory decision I make, unhappy or happy operators, I have to look at this all the time because I have to make sure that everybody's on board. So, so we talked about everything goes IP, but there's another trend. I know there's some people from Netflix here, and I'm sorry for using your brand name here, but there is another trend I would like to say, and that's we don't own things anymore. Yesterday, I actually went out and, and threw a lot of my things away uh, because my wife said so. And one of the things I, I, I actually threw away was my CD collection. Do you remember CDs? A couple of hundred of them. I got absolutely no use for them anymore. They were just taking. But well, we don't own. We rent, we store, we do other things. And that is another very, very important thing that we see in Sweden now. You call it cloud servicing. We call it another business model. But there is another, there is another trend as well. And that is, especially in the consumer area where we now see, and that is the new markets coming in with, with actually new entrants taking over it. How many of you don't want to you own the home, the home of, a, of a consumer digitally? I mean, you really, everybody wants to sell an equipment that makes the home of a user connected. And usually, it used to be the operator who came in there, or maybe the power company. And now there are new companies coming into the arena who wants to sell stuff that connects uh, whatever you have in your home to make it really digital. We see more and more of those companies, which are going to be a big part of the consumer digital environment or ecosystem in the future. And this is one of the big challenges we see right now, because this is going to have a big effect on how we regulate in the future as well, especially when it comes to privacy. What has it led to? Here I maybe disagree slightly with Eric. Because what we've seen is that you've now gone from one business model to three. First of all, the operators, and I'm sorry to say this because I can actually prove this by numbers, we see that the most successful operators are the ones who invent new business models. Because what happened with the old business model is that you're going down in the value chain. I mean, most companies that made money out of voice uh, many years ago don't make this. This thing is awful. Yeah. You, we now see three layers of companies, infrastructure companies that provide access to internet. When we look at them, to be honest, we see that companies that only have mobile, only have fixed, will have problems in the future because you need the combination because what, that's what the customer wants. In Sweden especially, this is a very clear trend. 
We have about 160 fiber owner companies, and they all make money. Most of them only sell black fiber. Black fiber is a utility product. They don't make huge operating margins, but they make margins on just providing simple, basic infrastructure. This is a very much utility-based, and we see a lot of operators who doesn't invest in new businesses actually go there. Then you have what Eric talked about, operators with services and access infrastructure. They don't need to own the infrastructure to be able to provide this business model. In Sweden, we've seen companies, uh, what we call them communication operators. They don't own the infrastructure themselves, they just manage other ones. Because with 108 to 170 fiber owners, someone has to give the ability to give actually an, an, a, a global access or an access, national-wide access. So management of infrastructure is another business model. And remember, 10 years ago, the operators in the world owned the customers. They provided the service, the network, the terminal, and everything else. And now they're going down in the value chain. And then you have the real ones. The reason why you go on internet. The mobile industry, or any industry, often call them over-the-top players, OTTs, which is a very strange thing to say, because that means that op operators will be under-the-floor operators. They're really the service and content providers, because I wouldn't use internet if I didn't have an application or service to get access to. But this is a totally different business model, and it will be different is like energy and what you use the energy for. We haven't even started to see the differences in all those combinations. And we haven't really understood the new bottlenecks. And that is the problem from a regulatory issue. The regulatory environment used to be fairly simple. Our job was, from we went from a monopolized market into a liberalized market, and by using regulation, we made sure that every had, everybody had access to copper, old copper networks, maybe the new fiber networks, the shared spectrum equally. Now we really understand, in this new business model, where does the, the new bottlenecks appear? For instance, there's a big discussion in Europe right now. We are in the middle of a, of a big legislative proposal where they said we should regulate CAPs, or as you usually call them, OTTs. Because Skype is a voice call, and they should, they should have the same obligations as everybody else. Which we, of course, think is wrong, because there's a difference between a Skype call and an ordinary telephone call. Does anyone know the difference? There's a telephone number. <laughs> and telephone number is a limited resource, and we give limited resource to certain companies, and that becomes obligations. The minute Skype is starting to use telephone numbers, that would be an obligation as well. But we have a lot of those discussions where we don't really understand where the bottlenecks will be in the future. But the ability for choice will always be the most important thing. That the customer always have more than one choice, because we think competition is what's going to drive this market anyway. To conclude, we don't really know either. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth, because nobody really, we know that, we, we, we can't even answer the simple question, is it going to be the fixed network whose determination point or the mobile network is going to be the determination point? I guess you guys have a view on that one, but we don't know, because it's going to have so much impact on standardization. And we don't know, how, we have another debate, we call net neutrality debate. Do you, are you familiar with that one? Uh, where people is trying to figure out what is internet. Because if you want to have put the legislation on, in, uh, on net neutrality, then you have to figure out what the internet actually is, which is a very interesting question, and we're working on that as well. What we're trying to do right now as a regulator, both in Sweden and in, in Europe, is to try to interact with more of the discussions, not only with the operators that we usually talk to, but the whole ecosystem to understand where the bottlenecks are. And I thought it was just proper not to give you all the answers this time, but actually just raise some of the questions with this one. So remember, my regulatory view on this one is very simple. I have to produce choice. I have to make sure there's integrity. I, I have to include everybody. That's the only thing I'm here to do all the time. That means I'm not here to make sure that everybody makes money, because I'm really here for customer's choice. And that is the new thing in regulatory theme in Europe right now. Thank you very much. Comments or questions to Joran? Uh, Gunnar? Mm -hmm. Oh, the operators? Yeah. 
<laughs> time dimension as well. So I wonder why can't I buy access to any public mobile network on a second or millisecond granularity? Why do I have to, to have a 24 month subscription? That's a very good question. But the, it's a very good question. I think that the mobile industry, and I'm being maybe a little bit open, the mobile industry as all industry is trying to adapt to a very big change right now when it comes to subscriptions models and so on. And we as a legislature often comes in trying to do the, this is the, you can't do worse than this. But we're starting to see that some operators now is, is totally open when it comes to change subscriptions or walking away from the old subscription models. We see that in Sweden, we see that in Europe, which I think is interesting. With Another thing which is happening on the subscription side right now is from the UK, when one of the operators has now for the first time made it possible for you to make a telephone call with a telephone number, both on a mobile and fixed, w on the same numbering plan, which I think is really, really interesting. I had, don't know how it works, technology, but it's a really interesting thing that's happening right now. Which, and I think everybody's now testing their models. But I also respect the fact that the mobile operators, or all the investor, has to make some money. Um, and I think that competition in that one will lead to a better result. We, from a legislature, we should not go down and actually detail everything how the subscription models look like, but we should make sure that you can do different things. But I think it's an excellent question I ask themselves. There is, there is at least one operator now in Sweden that you can uh, more or less immediately terminate your contract and buy something else. And I understand the customer likes it, which is the best thing. Well, we have an operator here, Franz. <laughs> Mic ah, yeah, yeah, ah, yeah, I have a microphone. Surprise, okay. where does this come from? <laughs> <laughs> I was not thinking out of the, out of the box for that one. Um, probably you had that question 500 times already. <laughs> um, what do you think? So, uh, strangely enough to say, I agree in many of the points you, you, you raised, which is unusual for an operator to agree with the regulator. Um, my question would be, what do you think, which of these questions are better sorted out on the, in your case, Swedish levels, and what are the questions that should be more driven on, on, on a European level? I think we have to sort them out. We have to sort them out on European level. Um, because at, at, I mean Sweden, Usually what happens is that we always think in Sweden that we're so far ahead. We're usually like three or four years ahead for some reason. In this area, there are other areas, of course, we, we are not as, as well equipped. But and when, when I, especially now, when it comes to this focus around the fixed network that we now see in Sweden, together with the 4G, I mean, go to Finland, they don't have very much fiber. They have an extremely good uh, mobile network and everybody goes mobile. But I think in the end, we will see the same result. And I, what, what we're doing right now, both in the BEREC, which is the regulators uh, group that I'm, um, the, the authority that I'm working in, and also together with the European Commission and also with the Parliament. And, and I think that everybody understands we have to harmonize as much as possible. But there is a big difference between the countries. I mean, your countries, for instance, um, don't have the same high-speed demand today, which means that my regulatory effects in, in, in... There has to be a leverage for the differences of the 28 member states as well. Harmonization should be used in such a good way that it actually enhances everybody and not disadvantages for everybody. But the discussion has to be on the European side. Yes, I had this discussion about 500 times. <laughs> Thank you, Arne. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, uh, could you please elaborate on your core question? Uh, mobile networks as access points to fixed networks contra uh, uh, fixed networks as access points to mobile networks. Clearly, it's not only a matter of whether you have a SIM card or not in a piece of, of the, uh, equipment. You're an so engineer, so aren't you? Uh, yeah. I used to be. <laughs> so, 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 the, so the question, what, what is really the key thing? Why does it matter so much for you? I mean, it has to do with standardization in a, in a way. Um, I mean, we're all working on, on standardization. Of, I mean, a 5G standardization is one of the big things. But to, to, to say what we're afraid of, and, and we are, I mean, first of all, we are afraid of, of monopolizing something that should have innovation because we give, the, through standardization, the opportunity for someone, uh, a group of industries, to, to own a market. To be honest, we could be afraid of turning internet into a cable TV system. 
and, and that's, that's potentially is actually bigger in the mobile space than it is in the fixed space. Because the way the mobile works, with all the network management that you have to do and all the things you can do with it, the way you look at traffic, the way that you encapsulate traffic in a mobile network compared to a fixed one. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, we are wrong, that everything this discussed is wrong. But we really need to understand the dynamics when it comes to IP. And I could be very you know, simple and say that I think access forms is one thing. Intelligence in the network should lay away from the network. That's the way it is today. Which is a completely different scenario than 5G, where you actually want to have more technology into the actual network. That could have very big pros. But it could have some cons for all the traffic that goes on the, on the, on the fixed network as well. So it's not a simple question. and um, We don't have the answer, but we're really trying to figure out. Because in the end, on the other side of this, we're going to do the standardization, we're going to do the regulation, it's going to be proposals to laws, um, and that's going to have a great effect. I'm going to look at healthcare, for instance. Healthcare, um, remote healthcare, or mobile healthcare, or whatever you are, Healthcare is a place where you probably need a lot of quality of service assurance, because if you want to, you know, if you want to connect to people that are your patients remotely, that is an area which is probably going to be regulated because society is going to demand it. And where do you put that demand? In a mobile network, in a fixed network, or in the layer above? So there are interesting questions in this one. And please, I mean, you have 48 hours. Hey, how hard can it be? <laughs> Okay, one last question, Kari. Kari uh, Leppänen, Huawei. Erik actually made an interesting point in the first talk about kind of networks, the physical network being one and then having kind of virtual slices of that. So, so basically it means that there's, well, in other words, there would be a monopoly for the physical network. So what is regulator's view on this kind of development? I, I think, in my opinion, that idea is good because that leads to cost savings. But from a competition point of view, what, what is your thinking about that? I mean, it's really how you, I mean, today in the physical network, you don't put that much, because of the way internet works, and you know better than me, it's very hard to put in the quality of service of, you know, in IP. That's why you try to invent things like MPLS, or I'm so old, so I call it tag switching. Um, but you, it's very hard to build in, because internet, because of all the physical points there is, IP traffic, traf you know, if you don't steer them, they will go anywhere you want. Total anarchy. I like that. Sorry, I used to work for Cisco many years ago, I'm sorry. <laughs> but on the other hand, there is a need for a high quality of service. There is a need for better management. I'm turning to you, I don't know why. <laughs> and we have to find this balance in this one. Total anarchy won't work. Total control won't work. It has to work as the end users want it, traveling on both networks. So where do you put the intelligence? On top of the net physical network, on, on, on besides the network? That could be re really interesting as well. And would have a great impact on, on discussions like net neutrality. Because net neutrality talks a lot about that everybody should have you know, access to open internet. I don't know what open internet is, and I'm in a part of that legislative proposal to discuss this right now. So how do you then, if you, if you then say that everything that you reach is going to be reached in an open, ethne, open internet, on the other hand, you have the right and should, as an operator, be able to manage your networks as well, so you don't get crowded in the base station. I have a very funny job. Every question you ask me, I can ask you back. Okay, I'm done. Uh, yeah, I think we'll uh, wrap it up here and uh, thank uh, Joran once more. Thank you. Mm -hmm.